Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so once again, it's a pleasure to be here. So, 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 so soon after last time as well. <laughs> um, uh, so, um, right, so a lot of, lot of what I'm going to talk about, I think the most exciting bits are still unproved. Um, so, um, so I'd be very interested in uh, any ideas anyone has about any of that because I think it's a very exciting subject. Um, so, so uh, four authors, and I mean, so the joint with Irma Angel, Dan Romick, and Balint Virag. And I think it's probably no secret to say that while all four of us made major contributions, really the, a lot of the vision for this project came from Dan Romick. So he's a very interesting guy, a very smart guy. And it's the papers, the first papers available on the archive, and uh, many other people have helped at the level of conversation. So I want to thank all of them. So what I want to try and tell you is what are these pictures and how are they related to each other. So let me start with something very simple. Okay, so everyone okay so far? <laughs> so, so think of this as... Uh, <laughs> So, so think of this as four items, four particles, and we want to uh, reverse the order of them. We want to get them into the order 4, 3, 2, 1. And we want to do it by nearest neighbor swaps only. So, um, so number one wants to get to the bottom, so I could start by swapping it with two like this. Um, and one still wants to go further down, so I could swap it with three and then swap it with four. So now... One is where it wants to be, but two, three, and four still have to be switched around. So, for instance, I could do the same kind of thing, move two down to there, and then to there, and then I only have to swap three and four over, and I'm done. Okay, so, um, well, yeah, so, oops. Right, so, so how many swaps did this take? Well, it took six, and in general, uh, to get from, if you had the numbers one up to n, to reverse the order of them, it's easy to see you need, uh, well, you certainly need at least n choose two swaps, because every pair of items has to swap somewhere, and you can easily convince yourself, for instance, by the algorithm that I used here, that you can do it in that, that many. So I'll call that capital N, n choose two. Um, but of course, even given the constraint that I do it in the minimum number of swaps and choose two, there are lots of ways to do it. So for instance, here I could have started by moving four up to the top and so on. So in general, I'll say a sorting network is any uh, way of doing this in the minimum number of swaps. So this is one example of a four-element sorting network. Okay. And yeah, so there's kind of an application-ish of this in, in computer science. So, um, so note that if wherever I have a swap here, if instead I have a comparator, so it's something that looks at the two numbers to the left, and if they are in increasing order, then it swaps them over, but they're, if they're in decreasing order already, then it does nothing, then uh, you can easily convince yourself that um, well, this network of comparators would sort any initial order into the reverse order for 3, 2, 1. And in fact, a sorting network, as I've described it, is exactly a sequence of comparators that's capable of doing that. So it's, so it's in some way related to the computer science problem of sorting. So if, in particular, if you want to design a circuit that's very, very good at you know, hardwired circuit that can sort 20 items very efficiently, then you're sort of playing this kind of game. Normally, 
people study something a little bit different where you're allowed to do several swaps at the same time and so on. But anyway, it's a slightly related to that. Anyway, I think it's a very interesting subject in its own right. Um, so, so Stanley was the first to study these things and he proved a remarkable formula for the number of n element sorting that works. That's this. And so Dan had the very nice idea of... Yes. Yes. So exactly the thing like this. So, uh, what? What's the formula? What, what does it mean? You mean? N here is 2 over 1 to the power n times 3 to the power n minus 1. It's an integer, it's not what's created. It's uh, than 1. than 1. <laughs> this is a tiny number. Yes. Oh, uh -huh. yes, there's a square that's missing. It should be n choose 2 squared, I believe. It should no. be something to the exponential. Maybe something to the exponential. Maybe something oh. to the exponential. Yeah, yeah. um, yes, I think it should be n choose 2 factorial. Oh, and the the will change once. <laughs> 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 Thank you for pointing that out. Uh, yeah, and, and she is too factorial over this, I believe. So I'm not going to use this. What I say. Uh, thank you for that. Um, okay, so Dan had the very nice idea of just asking what does a typical sorting network look like? Um, so, more precisely, you can fix n and then choose one of the n element sorting networks, one of these guys, uniformly at random, and ask what it looks like. Okay, so uh, for n equals v, you don't need Stanley's formula to work out that there are just exactly two sorting networks, this one and this one, so n equals v, I would pick each of those with probability a half. Okay, so what are the things you might be interested in? Well, maybe the simplest is just the swap locations. So if I just put a choose a uniform sorting network and put a blob every time there was a, a swap, then I can ask what this configuration of blobs looks like. Or I could ask for the trajectory of a particular particle, so here's the trajectory of particle 3, ask what they look like. And also, um, at any given time, so for instance this is uh, sort of time half, halfway through in time, I have a permutation and it's a random permutation if, you, if you're looking at a uniform sorting network. So you can ask, what does that random permutation look like? So one way of, of, doing, of looking at it is to just look at the permutation matrix. So here I have the permutation 2, 3, 4, 1, and I put in blob at distance 2, distance 3, distance 4, distance 1, and so on. So this is the, the ones in the permutation matrix. Okay, so I can ask about any of those things. So it turns out there's a nice exact simulation simulation algorithm for a uniform sorting network. So you can start producing some pictures. So here's a picture of so just a single uniformly chosen sorting network with n equals 100 elements, and these are the swap locations. So this is just the pink blobs. Okay, so you can already notice a few things. So it seems very homogeneous in this direction. So this is time going this way. This is space, zero, zero to 100. One in each column? Yes, that's right. And I've got this compressed so you can't see it. Uh, yes, it's very homogeneous this way and not so homogeneous this way, so there are more swaps around the middle than, than near the end, it seems. Um, and also there's some very interesting local structure. It, it's, it doesn't look like a Poisson process locally. It's... Uh, um, you know, you, the horizontal direction looks different from the vertical direction, I see. Um, and here's the same picture with n equals 2,000. So here, instead of just putting a black blob wherever there's a swap, I've just done a histogram. So this is space going this way. So you have particle 1 up to particle 2,000, and this is time going this way. And in each little square, the height of the bar is the number of swaps that happened there. And again, this is just a single sample of a 2,000 element sorting number. Okay, so you can certainly see very interesting things. So it looks like a cylinder. It's flat in this direction. And then you have this curve. So would anyone like to hazard a guess what the shape is this way? The <laughs> curve. <laughs> 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 
It's a, so it's a semicircle. But it seems you lost some of the fine structure that we saw in the previous slide. Yes, absolutely, yes. Mm -hmm. Previous slide had some structure, but it's not, it, maybe not multi-scale. Oh. Right, right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there's this kind of averaging really destroys that. I mean, there, there seems to be fine structure and, and also a, a sort of, oops, sort of global limit. Okay, so, well, this is one of the things, one of the few things where we really can say pretty precisely what some of the answers are. So here's just some notation. Here are the swap, no, swap locations. I'll uh, let S1 be the position of the first swap. So that's 1 because it happened here. This one's 2, this one's 3, and then this one's 1 again because it comes in the first <coughs> position vertically. Right? So that's just notation, S1 up to S capital N are these random numbers. Uh, so here's what we know. First of all, the sequence the random sequence of swap locations is stationary as a random sequence. Okay, so that's why everything looks so homogeneous from left to right. That's true for all n. That's not as Stationary under rotations more than n? Uh, no, just stationary is a finite sequence. So S1 and S2 have the same distribution, and the joint distribution of S1 and S2 is the same as the joint distribution of S2 and S3, and so on. Although, yeah, more is true as well become of that. Can you, can you, is it simple to tell us what's the exact algorithm sampling algorithm? Uh, no, but I'll tell you half of it later. <laughs> uh, it's not at all simple. Okay, um, so that's true. I'll show you the proof of this in a sec. Um, so then you can ask what's the distribution of the first swap. Well. If you just scale it by n, then it converges to a semicircle random variable. So, so the same is true for all swaps. And then finally, we have a law of large numbers. So if you just uh, look at the empirical measure of the collection of black blobs and just scale it so that the rectangle is always the same size, then uh, it converges to semicircle measure cross Lebesgue. So that's just exactly the statement that this picture is showing you. OK, and just to make it quite clear, this really is a random result. So uh, along with all, all the other asymptotic things that I'm going to say, and it's, it's not true that for all sorting networks, this is true, that you, you get this semicircular cylinder. Uh, it's simply what not true. So, hmm? What do you mean by all sorting networks? Well, so if you, if you pick a particular deterministic sorting network like bubble sort, which is like what I did at the beginning okay, with the okay, one okay, going okay. to the end, and two, then it's just not enough. A silly comment, just just to share that this no, is there's really. Something a much stronger in the picture than the theorem, because the picture suggests that you have almost sure convergence. This is just. No. When you say this converges in distribution, uh, you can say what you mean. Uh huh. Yes. Uh -huh. What you mean? This is the second typo. That it's really a law of large numbers. So it's it's not in distribution. Sorry. Well. Yeah, no, no, it's right. So, so this is a random measure, and it converges to this deterministic measure. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, And something else which is in progress. So hopefully we can prove something like this. Uh, it's not finished yet. It is just one little thing about the local limit. So if you just take a little window here of, of uh, fixed width k uh, and just take it long enough in time that you see k swaps in that window, and then you take the limit as n goes to infinity with k fixed, then that process should have a random limit. Well, that's not particularly, su particularly surprising. But also, uh, we think that limit should not depend on where this is located vertically. So if you take your window in the middle, 
you should get the same process as if you take it a quarter of the way down, for instance. It's just, of course, you have to make the, the window longer in order to get the same number of swaps because of the semicircle law. Okay, so hopefully something of that form is true. Um, okay, well, let me prove something. Let me prove this stationarity statement. It's actually very, very easy. So here's a sorting network. Let me remove the first swap. Okay, so what I have left is no longer a sorting network, of course, because it's not long enough. But let me at least make it look like a sorting network by just starting with the numbers in the order 1, 2, 3, 4. So, of course, at the end, I don't get 4, 3, 2, 1. I have 1 and 2 the wrong way around because they were supposed to swap at the beginning and they didn't. So I can now make it into a sorting network by making 1 and 2 swap at the end, like that. So now this is a sorting network because I end in the right place and it's the right length, so it has to be. Um, so what that tells you is that this transformation, well, it's clearly a bijection and it maps the set of sorting networks to itself. So you remove the first swap and put it at the end except reflect it between the top and the bottom. So it swaps the same uh, particles over. Okay, so that means it preserves the measure. So in particular, S2 up to Sn is equal in distribution to this. And if you think about it, that's enough to tell you stationarity of a finite sequence. And so in answer to your question, if you extend it to an infinite sequence by just keeping on doing this, you, you keep on adding the element to the end but flipping it over, then you get a, a, an infinite stationary sequence or, or a periodic sequence of period twice the length of the original thing. Um, okay, so that's all we know about the swap process. So uh, there's another thing you can look at, and the trajectories. So this is, again, n equals 2,000, and I plotted not all the trajectories, but maybe 100 of them. So this is what they look like. So uh, particle 1 starts at the top and wants to end up at the bottom, but it doesn't go in a straight line. It goes in this nice sweeping curve. Similarly, particle n does a nice sweeping curve up. Particle n over 2 starts somewhere in the middle, and it wants to end up in the middle, but it doesn't just hang around in the middle. It sweeps up nearly to the top and back again. And some other particles near the middle sweep almost to the bottom and back again. And yet others near the middle don't sweep all the way to the top. They just sweep part of the way and end up around the middle. It's a very, very interesting and surprising structure. Yeah. It was easier. So, is there something more general about, like, you know, just random diameters in a KD graph, uh, paths in a, which is a diameter in a KD graph? So, uh, the stationarity just that was the proof. It will be the um, same. But the, uh, is there a, like a, a limit question. theorem? Or? Oh. Uh, oh uh, that's a good question. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, short, short it would. Surely it will depend on the, on the Cayley graph, but, yeah, but yeah. It has to be a sequence of Cayley graphs or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, so we can do the same thing for, like, I don't know, SL2 over a finite field mm -hmm. or stuff like that. Yeah, this, this might be very interesting. And, and, and it may well be that lots of these things generalize. Yeah. Yeah. That might be a good way to think about it as well. Um, okay, so who would like to guess what these curves are? Right, sine curves, that's what we think too, <laughs> but we can't prove it. Uh, so again, just notation, let me, so this is the trajectory of particle i, and let me just scale it so that time goes from 0 to 1 and space goes from minus 1 to 1. So the conjecture is that the trajectories converge to random sine curves in a, a very strong sense, so uniformly over the particle and and time. So you have a sine curve with a random amplitude and a random phase, but the, uh, the frequency is always such that you, uh, you know, the sorting network is half of the period. So, so at the end, you end up in the reflected position. Um, and the evidence for this is much stronger than just eyeballing the picture, and I'll explain that later, but it's unproved. 
uh, we can prove something much more modest, which is that um, the trajectories, scale trajectories, at, at least have subsequential limits, and they're held at a half. It's the constant in the. I mean, it, yeah. I mean, it's sort of important that there is a constant there because that's how you know they have subsequential limits. Would that, of course, the fact that the constant doesn't depend on n or anything is the a eyes are uniformly bounded, or? Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, I've already scaled things so that they just live in this rectangle. So, so, so the a eyes have to be yeah. at most one. Yeah. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, so the other thing you can look at is the, the matrix. So this is n equals 2,000, and this is the permutation matrix of the permutation at half time. What is the matrix? Yes, these are the ones in the permutation matrix. So, pretty striking picture. So, <laughs> so, so clearly it seems to be circularly symmetric, and but also that you know, there are more particles near the edge of the circle, more dots near the edge of the circle. So, uh, and what do you think is this intensity profile from the inside to the outside? Well, it kind of looks like looking at a sphere, right? And so that's the conjecture that, that yeah? Is there a hard limit on the circle? Because it looks like the inequalities that force a termination will, 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 will have a, a poly poly polygonal form and not a spherical form. Uh, well, I mean, n nothing like this is, is proved, but the, the conjecture would be that if you take this circle and uh, expand it by epsilon, where you know, epsilon is just a fixed fraction of, the, of this size of the square, then with probability 1, everything lies inside it. Yes, so take... Uh, so take the surface measure on the sphere, on the, on the two sphere in three dimensions, uh, and project it onto the plane. Oh, okay. So that's what this is. Um, and let me show you. So this is time a half, and let me show you other times as well. Whoops. Well, I guess this you, you basically know that every vertical section has the same number. So, so, so if you believe it's circularly symmetric, then yeah. that's the only possibility. So, every vertical, every vertical slice has the same number of dots as any other vertical slice, the same width. And that kind of a, is a well-known feature of the projection. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so what is this? Okay, so this is, so that was at time and a half. This is the whole animation of the permutation matrix. So it started off as a line like this because you start from the identity matrix, uh, the identity permutation, and it ended up as a line this way because you end up at the reverse permutation. And I can continue it past the end by, by this remark earlier. Uh, the colors don't mean anything at the moment. They will later. And so, yeah, so halfway you get a circle, and it looks like at other times you have an ellipse. Yes? If you ignore the fine detail, it looks like a Bissajou figure with two side waves slightly out of whack. Uh huh. Is uh, that what it looks uh -huh. like? Or the yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that gives you an ellipse, right? So, so. Mm hmm. So, yeah, so you guys have sort of already said <laughs> everything on this slide almost. So the conjecture is that if you look at the permutation matrix halfway through and you scale it <laughs> in the obvious way, then it converges to Archimedes measure. Yeah, and it converges almost surely to the deterministic measure. Um, so what's that? It's, it's what I said, that the projection of surface measure on the two-sphere 
onto the plane. And um, yeah, so this is the unique circularly symmetric measure that has uniform linear projections in each direction. And that comes from this observation of Archimedes that if you take a sphere, then the, the surface area of it between two horizontal planes is the same as the surface area of a cylinder circumscribing it. And uniqueness comes from abstract nonsense, and you can write down the formula if you really want to. And furthermore, we conjecture that the scaled permutation at time t of the way through converges to some linear transformation of the Archimedes measure. And this concentrates on an ellipse. Um, so once again, we can prove something much more modest, which is that um, the, uh, the permutation matrix is, with high probability as n goes to infinity, concentrated in a certain octagon. And there's a formula for the octagon, which I won't bother giving, but here are the pictures. So here are 10 snapshots of a sorting network, and the red curve is the conjectured ellipse and the blue lines are what we can actually prove. So for instance, at half time, we know that asymptotically there are no particles in these little corner regions, and the, the width of that region is some fraction of it. OK. Yes, I'll try to show you some proofs. Um, yeah, so for everything we can do uh, just comes from these two things. Um, there's a bijection, a very remarkable thing due to Edelman and Green between the set of sorting networks and the set of standard staircase-shaped young tableau. And if you don't know what those are, I'll tell you. And then... Oh, OK, if you want to study these things and you have a bijection, then maybe you can study these things instead and transfer, and that's how we do it. So there's a uh, new result for um, random ones of these, staircase-shaped young tableau. And it's, it's strongly based on... on uh, the question was the first of the year, not yes. whether it's based on... <laughs> yes, so, so, so this result is... is, is Oh, that's inside the room. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll get the, the whole thing. Is, <laughs> the whole thing is oh, you want it. <laughs> yes, so, 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 very beautiful result due to Patel and Romick. Uh, I don't think it's appeared yet, but certainly will. It's on the archive. Uh, okay, so these are the two major ingredients. Um, okay, so, so what are staircase young tableau? So here's a staircase-shaped Young diagram. So it's an array of squares like this, uh, n minus 1 rows and n minus 1 columns, say. So this is n equals 5. And the number of squares is n to 2, what I'm calling capital N. You can easily see. So that's a Young diagram. This is a Young tableau, a, a standard staircase-shaped Young tableau. That means you fill the squares with the numbers 1 up to capital N in such a way that each row and each column is increasing. So here we have 1, 2, 4, 8 is increasing, 2, 5, 10 is increasing, and so on. Okay? That's a young tableau, standard young tableau of staircase shape. Um, okay, so the Edelman Green bijection is a bijection between these things and sorting networks. Right? So here's how it goes. First of all, you find the largest entry, so entry number 10 here. So that has to be on this diagonal because of the um, increasing property. And you remove it. And I'm just going to put a little blob to remind myself where it was before I removed it. And then what you do is you replace, so now you have a hole where the 10 was and you replace it with the larger of the elements above and to the left. So Scott Sheffield had a nice way of thinking of this, which is uh, the person at the front of the queue who'd been waiting longest leaves, and then uh, the one who's been waiting longer out of these two goes into the spot. 
So here, 7 is bigger than 5, so 7 moves into this spot. And then you repeat. So now, actually, uh, so here there is an empty space, and there isn't anything here, so it has to be the one above, which is 3 that moves into it. But otherwise, you would pick the larger of this and this, and so on. 1 moves into the space, and now you always end up with a space in the top left corner, so you fill that with a 0. Uh, it's always above and to the left. You, you, you look at the ones above and to the left, and whichever of those is larger. So that's just preserving the unstable nature of the. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yes. yes. Okay, so and you fill the, the corner with a zero, and then just to keep everything looking nice, you increment everything by one. So instead of zero to nine, now you have one to ten again. So this is a young tableau again, standard young tableau. And now you repeat. Find the biggest entry, it'll be 10 again. Remove it. And then you do this same sliding, fill with a zero, increment everything. And now you repeat again. So now the 10's at the top, so you do this. And update the tableau, find the biggest entry, and so on. So you keep on going, and each time I'm putting a pink blob to remind myself where was the entry that I removed, the largest entry. So you keep on doing that. But there was no moving. Yeah, so I'm just <laughs> keeping a list. That, that was, this, this was the first one, and then well, that's the second one. To begin with. What? It was higher, oh, they were, they were shifting down um, into yeah, the right. Yeah, I'm that way. <laughs> <laughs> to confuse us? <laughs> No, to, not to confuse me. <laughs> <laughs> to avoid confusing. <laughs> you can just one. Yes, I mean you don't strictly speaking need to do that, but yeah. but it doesn't make any difference. But, yeah. Okay, so you keep going and do it for capital N steps, which is exactly the number of cells you had. So and everything has come out. So here I did it for ten steps. And then you have this rectangle of pink blobs, and you just rotate it through 45 degrees to the left. Whoops. And the claim is it gives the swap locations of a sorting network. So at least you can see there are, there are four rows because there were four places on the diagonal, and there are ten columns, so at least it's the right size, so completely non-obvious, but it gives you a sorting network. Okay. And also completely non-obvious, this is a bijection between young tableau and sorting networks, and also completely non-obvious, you can explicitly describe the inverse of this bijection by a somewhat more complicated algorithm, but still quite a nice one. Possibly, but I don't know it. So it's not the usual representation theory thing concerning young tableau. I'll try now. Um, okay, so completely remarkable result, but quite useful. So here's the other ingredient then of the things we can prove. So this is this theorem by Patel and Vomick. If you um, look at a square young tableau, so that's um, you, know, you just you just take take an n by n square. And and fill it with the numbers one up to n squared in such a way that each row and each column is increasing and you pick such a thing uniformly from all the possibilities, so uniform random n by n square young tableau. Uh, so this is a picture when n equals 50. So here's the square, and the, and the height is just the number that you put in that cell. That's a, that's a random sample. Then it turns out there's a limiting shape for this. You let n go to infinity, there's a limiting shape. And in fact, they can compute it explicitly, so there's some complicated formula, which I won't talk about. This is a formula for the contours in some funny coordinate system. 
Okay, so that's that. Um, so as a corollary, so um, much less impressive than this result of Patel and Omic, but useful for us, um, we can do the same thing for a staircase-shaped tableau. Okay, well, the idea is that the staircase-shaped young tableau looks like half of a square tableau. And if you look at this limiting shape, then uh, along the diagonal, it, it's flat, as it really has to be, if you, if you believe there's a deterministic limiting shape. So intuitively, that suggests that the limiting shape for a uniform staircase-shaped tableau ought to be just half of this shape. You just chop off the corner half. I mean, it's, it's not trivial because, of course, the, the square tableau is not exactly flat here. It's flat with some fluctuations. So you have to, you know, there's, there's some work there, and it wasn't immediately obvious just how to do it, but we managed it. So, so for the uniform staircase tableau, the limiting shape is exactly half of this shape. But is it also flat in each parallel line, uh, line uh, no, parallel no. to this or not? No. Uh, the, the contours, so here's, here's half of it. The contours look like straight here, and then there's something like this. They, they actually have an end point. On the edge, something like this. Okay, so those are the two ingredients. So now let me um, prove prove this law of large numbers: the fact that the swap locations converge to a semicircle cross Lebesgue measure. Um, okay, so basically, what I want to do is look at the swaps that take place in a space-time window. So let me take it short in time, so from zero to time, time epsilon times the whole thing, and from position A to position B. Okay, well, if you think back to the Edelman-Green bijection, then these, the, the first epsilon n swaps all come from the large elements in the young tableau. So you take a random staircase young tableau, it's it's where these entries end up coming out that determines where the first epsilon n swaps are. Right, the, the entry is greater than 1 minus epsilon times n. Yes, so by the limiting shape theorem, we basically know where those entries are. There's some curve. And we also want just those of the swaps that exit in this particular window from a n to b n from here to here, say. And you know, in the algorithm, the, the, these entries gradually percolate their way out, and they can only move right and down. So an entry that starts here has to exit in some triangular region somewhere. Okay, so that means the entries that come out here, well, uh, all of the entries in this region have to exit through the interval and none of the ones outside this bigger region can do. So the swaps I'm interested in are you know, basically bounded between these two shapes. And the way I drew it to these two shapes look very different in area, but if I'd made epsilon small so that this uh, pink region is very flat, um, but still keep a n and b n a fair way apart, then that wouldn't be true. So, so these to be close to each other. Um, and so to estimate this number, you, you just need to know um, something about the shape. In particular, you need to know the area under this curve between here and here. And that you can get from the formula for the limit shape, and it turns out to be a semicircle. Okay, so that's where it comes from. Yeah. Uh, first order approximation of the power series expansion near the diagonal mm -hmm. in the direction perpendicular to the diagonal of this mm 
Okay, I'll say a little bit about the other two theorems, although not as much. Um, so for this, we use the inverse of this Edelman-Green bijection. Um, so as I said, you can explicitly describe the inverse. I won't do it because it would take a little bit too long. It's, it's a bit more complicated. But you can, and it's, and that it's a little bit like the famous RSK algorithm, for people who know what that is. Um, and in particular, you can deduce some things. Um, you can deduce that if you look at the entries less than k in the first row of the staircase young tableau, then the number of such entries is a bound on the longest increasing subsequence in the swap process. So you look at the sequence of pink blobs that form the swap process, and just the first k of them, uh, look at the longest increasing subsequence. So here's an increasing subsequent sequence of length 4. So this is bound for this. And if you think about it, this gives you an upper bound for the furthest any particle can move to the right in the first case swaps. Oh, maybe I should have said up. So if here's a particle that starts here and ends up k places further up, at the uh, sorry, ends up m places further up, say, after k swaps, then at some point it must have moved from here up to one place higher, so that must have been a swap in that position, and it might have gone down and wiggled about, but then at some place it must have moved, moved one place higher, and so on. So there has to be an increasing sequence of swaps of the appropriate length. Okay, so that's basically all there is to it. So, so you can bound this thing using information about the shape of the tableau, and that, that, that then gives you some bound on how far particles have moved by a certain time. That gives us the octagon bound and also this Holder, Holder continuity statement. Um, no, it's just... Um, it's just what the bound looks like for, for small time. So, um, so how does it work when, when k is small? You, you ask how. <coughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, yeah, maybe it is something to do with n versus n squared. It's it's how how long this row is for small k. Yeah, so, so it is something like area versus width, I guess. Okay, so that's that. So finally, to say something with less theorems in it, uh, why do we believe the conjectures? So there's really a very strong reason, which is, is what you were hinting at, I think. Um, so, okay, we're interested in this Cayley graph, basically, of the symmetric group generated by nearest neighbor swaps. So there's a very natural way to embed that in Euclidean space, which is the following. Given a permutation, think of its inverse, depending on how you define things, at least. I call it the inverse. Um, so sigma inverse of 1 is the position that particle 1 is in. Sigma inverse of 2 is the position that particle 2 is in. Okay? And you just think of that as a vector, a point in Rn. Okay, so this gives you a way of embedding the Cayley graph in Rn. And you can easily convince yourself that actually all the points lie on a certain n minus 2 sphere in Rn because they all lie in a hyperplane because the sum is constant and also the sum of the squares is constant. Um, okay, and it has other nice properties. that um, so, so the edges of, of the Cayley graph end up being quite short and all the same length. So, so here's what it looks like for n equals 4. You can, it, it, it embeds in a two-sphere, and it actually looks like a truncated octahedron. So there's a picture. And just for amusement, here's what it looks like for n equals 5. So for n equals 5, it lives on a three-sphere, and you can map a three-sphere into R3 by projection. That's 
what it looks like. Okay, so, okay, and you can also easily convince yourself that the identity permutation, 1, 2, 3, 4, and the reverse permutation, 4, 3, 2, 1, are antipodal points on the sphere. Okay, so what is a sorting network? It's a minimal length path on the Cayley graph between these two antipodal points. Okay, and you know, now you get into dream mode and you say, well, the uh, a shortest path between two antipodal points on a sphere is a great circle. Right, so maybe a typical sorting network should look like a great circle on the permutahedron. And, well, you can show just by some very soft geometry that um, if just a deterministic and non-random sorting network lies close to some great circle on the permutahedron, then all the things I'm trying to make you believe hold. So the trajectories are approximated by sine curves. That's kind of almost obvious the half-time permutation is approximated by Archimedes' measure, and interestingly, the swap process is given by the semicircle cross Lebesgue. And so remember this, we can actually prove for the uniforms. Just the adjacent points. Um, the same intuition applies, these are antipodal points. Uh, but not no, but so not much, because... Between, between neighbors. Yeah. Yeah. And I define neighbors. I mean, I'm doing looking at the Cayley graph. Yeah, okay, but it doesn't, it doesn't live on the sphere. You're going to make huge jumps. So it doesn't live on yeah. the sphere in the same natural way. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's true. That's, 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 that's in the sense that this is the most difficult sequence to solve. One of the 12 the most operations. Yes, right. Mm. Uh -huh. Yeah. I don't know that. Yeah. yeah. I think it's right. Right. Uh, well, yeah, but for, for nearest neighbor swaps, as you say, the, the reverse permutation is the one that's furthest from the identity, and if you allow all swaps, then... The, well, why should it be that rather than... Something? No, well, in, on three elements, it's not true, for example. Because in three elements, one transposition is enough, but, but in general, you need to... Yeah, so I don't think there's a unique antipode if you allow all swaps and holders. Anyway, I think it would be different. Um, and I'm um, sorry, I'll make this a little bit more precise. So there are lots of different versions of this theorem depending on what you mean by close and what these approximately equal to's mean. But for example, uh, if it's close in in L infinity distance, so if it's if the L infinity distance is little O of n, as n goes to infinity, then all the conjectures that I mentioned before would, would follow. And simulations suggest that, indeed, this is true for a uniform sorting network, and much more than you need. So maybe I shouldn't have actually put big O of root n, but uh, you know, simulations suggest that the L infinity distance is something like a constant times root n asymptotically, and all you need it to be is little lower bend. So it suggests, like the, suggests the convergence is much better than you need for all these things. So all you need to show is that for any two, I think for the two antipodal points, most of this shortest path in the commuter is your line close to Yes. Yes. Um, so, uh, yeah, let me show you Another picture. Okay, so this is the picture you saw before. 
Now, if... Okay, let, let, let me do something different. So, so here, you can think of it as for each particle, I'm plotting a graph of the particle number, i, against where the particle is at time t. Right? And I'm showing you the animation as t varies. So instead of doing that, I can plot a graph of where the particle is at time t against where it is at time t plus a half, half of the total sorting network. I can put a dot there for every particle. So if you do that, here's what you see. Okay, so most of this we could have predicted already because um, at any given time, well, at time zero, this is just the halfway permutation, so you know it looks circular. By stationarity, you know it should always look circular because what I'm doing here is I'm just looking at some sliding window. I have my sorting network like this, and I'm just looking at a window of length n over 2 and looking at the permutation I get from considering just the swaps in that window. So by stationarity, it always looks the same. And you have this very nice rotation, uniform rotation. So the rotation is what you would expect if you believe the sine curve conjecture, because if you have a sine curve and you, you know, plot the coordinate at time t against the coordinate at time t plus pi over 2, then it's sine against cos, so it rotates in a circle. Um, and to just ram it home even more, if I were to rotate the screen anti-clockwise at a uniform speed at the same time, you would see presumably everything being still, so rather than doing that, I'll do it in the software. So I'm just rotating the whole picture anti-clockwise at a uniform speed. So now, basically, the particles don't move. They just jiggle about a bit. And now, instead of letting them jiggle, I can just plot their paths as they jiggle around. And this is what you get. And they're very localized. So, and the degree to which they're localized is basically the degree to which all these conjectures are true. And you know, just by eyeballing, it seems that no matter what n is, the, these little squiggles kind of just touch each other. And if you think about what that means, that's basically saying you're within root n, or constant root n, of a great circle. In this picture, you've drawn all particles, or, you, yes. or you've just sampled all. a few? All. This is 2,000. Um... Okay, so the, I mean, the proof of that theorem I just showed you about if you're close to a great circle, I mean, it's basically pretty easy. So if you're close to a great circle, then you certainly have sine trajectories up to some time change, but the same time change for all particles, because you don't know that you're going along the great circle at a uniform speed yet. Um, and that tells you that uh, you have this rotating disk picture, basically. It tells you that there's some configuration of points in the plane, and if you rotate it and then look at what their x coordinates do, then that gives you roughly the sorting network. Um, and if you have that, then all the projections of that set of points in every direction have to be uniform. So that tells you that they are basically distributed according to the Archimedes measure. But then you know that the swap rate has to be uniform because, after all, the definition of time t is it's the t time at which you've had t swaps. So that means, actually, this, un this rotation has to be uniform. So there's no time change. And then you can do a calculation, and you get the semicircle law um, for, the, for, the, for uh, you know, how many swaps you get in a particular position. And yeah, so. So really, the evidence is, is very, very strong for all these conjectures. So you have the, the pictures. You have the fact that the, the great circle conjecture seems so natural. You know, you're, you're living on a sphere and so on. And you have the, the simulation. You can measure this kind of root n sort of thing. And also, I mean, one thing that's very nice is we get back to the semicircle law. You know, if, if you assume the conjecture, then you get the semicircle law. 
and we know by a completely different argument that for a uniform sorting network, you get the semicircle law, and it's really a completely different calculation. So, you know, this one comes from considering things moving in circles and signs and cosines and stuff, and, and the other one comes from the limit shape for young tableau. It's really together, I think it's very strong. Circumstantial evidence, at least. So finally, lest you think it's too easy, so there are lots of things you might think should be true that are not. So, okay, so certainly we know it's not true that for any sorting network, so any path between the two antipodal points is a great circle. That's not true. You can just consider bubble sort or something. So, but you might think, so it's just a typical one. So now you might think if you take any two points on the, on the permutahedron, one of them can be the identity, if you like, then, then the path between them, the typical path between them, ought to look like the great circle that passes through those two points. But that's not true. So, for instance, consider, um, well, yeah, consider the typical sorting network that passes through this permutation, where you reverse the numbers 1 up to n over 2, and you reverse the second half as well. Okay, so what does a typical sorting network through this look like? So you start in order and you end up in reverse order and halfway through. Yeah, so this, this is about halfway through in, in distance on the Cayley graph. So what does it look like? Well, in the first half, you have a uniform sorting network to reverse the first half and a uniform sorting network to reverse the second half, interspersed in time in some uniformly chosen way. And in the second half, you do something different. You have to swap the two halves. So, okay, what do the trajectories look like? Well, particle one in the first half, it looks like this. So it's a sine curve, but not the right sort. It's a sine curve with, with period, you know, the wrong period and the wrong position and so on. So already that tells you that the path looks nothing like a great circle. So the typical path passing through this point is nothing like a great circle at all. So it's much more subtle. It's really for, uh, well, but yeah, so, so you can also show that this permutation is very, very unlikely to arise. So it's very unlikely that the um, uniform sorting network goes through this, much less likely than the average permutation. Um, so you really just have to show this for, for typical points, the typical path through a typical point looks basically all I have to say, except to show you our best picture yet. So this is the, the same picture I showed you with the, the squiggles that you get by unrotating this rotating disk. And this is for n equals 10,000. So 10,000 squiggles, and hopefully I can zoom in. So very, very circular. And the squiggles are very localized. So again, they, roughly speaking, just touch each other. So I'll stop there.